Welcome back, everybody, to this afternoon of our Beverly Hills Bar Association Family Law Symposium. We thank our sponsors, who are Myod and Company CPAs, White Zuckerman, Warzowski, Luna, and Hunt, our Family Wizard, Tatiana Skevin, CPA, Linda Shower, Forensic CPA and Associates, Myod and Company CPAs, they are the company that provides you with assistance in all your litigation, financial, and business affairs. Assistance that will approve your total financial well-being. White Zuckerman, Warzowski, Luna, and Hunt provides a wide variety of resources to complete almost any project, large or small. They also provide traditional accounting and tax practice services. We invite you to contact them to discuss your specific accounting needs and learn how they can be of service to you. And Our Family Wizard is a secure co-parenting platform that provides divorced or separated parents in managing the daily responsibilities of raising children. Specialized features help co-parents organize routines, share files, track expenses and payments, check in at exchanges, send messages, and more, all while thoroughly documenting their activity. Now, without any more delay, I am excited to present on panel three the outstanding Judge Diana Gould-Saltman the renowned Peter Waltzer, and the unparalleled Dr. Robert Simon. Thank you so much for being here. And panel three, I turn it over to you. Kendra, thank you very much. Appreciate the kind words. And thank you for giving um, uh, Judge Gould Saltman, Mr. Walzer, and myself an opportunity to be a part of your conference this morning. Um, and thanks to my co-presenters for cooperating and working with me. Our uh, presentation this morning, or this afternoon, I should say, is called Mediating and Litigating COVID-Induced Custody Issues. Um, we have, as we all know, we are going through and have been through some extraordinary times that have, have raised, has raised issues that um, we have not considered or very, um, very poorly considered and from which we have learned a great deal and continue to learn. And our purpose this morning is to sort of continue that discussion um, uh, of these issues. By no means are we done with these issues or this pandemic, I don't think. So we're continue to learn. So this is not a presentation about definitive truth. It's a presentation about a process of discussion uh, learning together and, and and practicing together in the rearview mirror. Um, if we put our if we all put ourselves back in March, April, May, June, even of 2020, in the rearview mirror was a growing, terrifying event in the world. This pandemic called COVID. We did not yet have a vaccine. Didn't know when we'd have one the science of this virus, how the disease was spread, uh, what really were the risky and less risky places was unknown. All kinds of rumors about how it happened, whether it was a conspiracy, whether it was an accident and things like that were going on. I think we were all frightened um, and um, frightened for our own health, frightened for the future of our families, frightened for the future of our work, frightened for the future of our society. At the same time as we're seeing daily images of filled up hospital rooms, um, trucks parked outside of hospitals, specifically to store excess deceased bodies and things like that. It was a very, very frightening time. That's in the rear view mirror. Um, we've learned a lot since then. And more going back locally, uh, our practices were besieged by cust uh, COVID induced custody issues. Um, we couldn't really help people in the way we once were able to. We couldn't get into the courts. Uh, we didn't know whether custody exchanges were essential. The county rules varied uh, from Orange County had a rule San Francisco County had a rule. Los Angeles County didn't have a rule. Um, some counties stated that COVID-19 was not enough to suspend visitation or parenting time. Other, most counties didn't even comment. Um, uh, regardless of county orders, we know that ex party orders cannot be used unless there's a, you know, immediate harm to the child and an exchange of visitation. It wasn't clear that that was enough. We'll get 
more into ex parties at the end of our program. The access to the court rooms was non-existent or in some cases limited. We were all getting used to Zoom, but Los Angeles County at least didn't really have that kind of access until months, months later. So um, it wasn't clear whether even parents were obligated to follow the custody orders and you couldn't tell the difference between real or trumped up uh, uh, excuses for not exchanging the children. Were the, was the other parent in the pod? Was the other parent, uh, did the other parent have custody, uh, um, have uh, COVID? Were they exposed to COVID? Were their friends exposed to COVID? It was all very unclear. Monitored visitation orders were hard to implement. In part, we're looking at cases where if there was an existing monitored visitation order, these are the fragile cases. These are cases either where there are allegations and the hearing hasn't yet happened, or there's been a hearing and it's been determined that the appropriate relationship between a parent and a child must be supervised. And when we didn't have a safe way to do that, those fragile relationships became even more so. Zoom visitation or similar platforms became the norm. Um, that's not something that wasn't existing before. We certainly had had those in cases where parents lived, you know, countries apart or states apart. Um, custody orders that involved air travel became impractical um, or impossible to implement if there was no air travel between places. Quarantine orders made interstate custody orders impossible to implement. Um, and the LA courts were not completely closed, but effectively closed except for restraining orders and true emergency ex parte orders. To top things off in terms of the rear view mirror, medical professionals, mental health professionals, dental professionals, were discouraged from spending time with people unless they were six feet apart. Um, and I, I can say from my colleagues, um, we were all terrified of sitting in the same room with, with a, a client in therapy or, or, or doing interviews for evaluations or mediations with people. And we were not yet really facile, familiar or comfortable with remote technology like the Zoom that we're using today. So much of the services simply stopped. People were advised not to gather with members outside their own household. And I mean, I recall, for example, once going to pick up groceries um, at a grocery store near my house. And of course, next to me was another car picking up groceries and the woman got outside of her car to, I guess, get some fresh air. And I, I remember sitting in my car, this is very early in the pandemic, thinking, get back in your car, you might kill me by standing next to my car. It was that kind of thing. Pods did form. So families would agree to, to form pods so that children could interact, so that adults could have adult companionship. But of course, at that point, you had to have rules for the behavior of the pod and trust that everybody in the pod was going to follow all of those rules. Because if they didn't, then there was concern that the pod didn't provide adequate safety. We should also circle back later to address the issue of the long-term psychological impact on children, on adults, and on relationships. The Canadians early on um, developed a, a concept of an echo pandemic that once we had overcome the medical issues, which we haven't fully overcome, that there was likely to be another pandemic of psychological damage um, which would get worse the longer the pandemic went on. Yeah, I'm going to a, a seminar all next week, and I don't know whether to handshake people, hug people, do a triangle hug, a, a quadrilateral triangle hug. Uh, I can't figure it out. It's like, do you wear your mask? Do you not? How do you wear your mask and eat at the same time? Uh, haven't figured that out. And if you have a hole in your mask, what good is the mask? So it's quite confusing. Uh, and we are in that period where the rules are blurred. Many schools have resumed in-person learning, but there are variants abounding. And uh, 
there's bound to be more. It seems to be we're seeing the future and certainty is not what it looks like. And uh, uh, recently, as in last week, uh, vaccines were approved for children between five and 11 year olds. Uh, what does that mean? They're going to be pe people that still don't want their children vaccinated. They don't want to be vaccinated and it creates all sorts of complications and people, including people being terminated from their jobs for not being vaccinated. Uh, should income be imputed to them? I mean, all sorts of crazy issues. Um, so, uh, you know, get used to your mock hugs and wearing your masks when you should and shouldn't. So these are not easier times by any means for the courts or for us, even if you're vaccinated, because you don't know who is and who isn't. And uh, wish me luck on my plane ride for four hours when people sometimes wear their masks and sometimes don't. You know, it, it strikes me too, Peter, that you were talking about mock hugs and do we shake hands? What do we do? We may be comfortable doing one thing and the person we approach may be comfortable doing something different and may feel like we're being disrespectful or, or dangerous with them. And, and all of these things remain unknown, especially as we return to in-person conferences, larger group gatherings and things like that. We're going to be feeling our way through all of this. So now we have quite a long hypo, but I think you'll recognize it and each of us are going to take uh, turns starting with the judge. So take it away, read it slowly so people can get a sense of what we're talking about. But I think you'll know it when you see it. So, Well, and some of us have already seen it. Um, <laughs> we, have, we have David. David lives in an apartment in Chatsworth, and he and his ex-wife, Clarissa, who lives in Van Nuys and not that far apart, share custody of four-year-old Anne and 10-year-old Ben, pursuant to a judgment of dissolution of marriage filed in Los Angeles on January 10th, 2020. They have a 225 schedule. Clarissa is dating Richard, who on occasion spends the night. Richard is not vaccinated. He believes that his family is protected and that COVID can be cured by prayer. Ben was enrolled in an elementary school and Anne was enrolled in preschool. In October, uh, pardon me, on October the 22nd, David decided that he would not return the kids to their mother, to Clarissa, on Friday morning for her parenting time. So Clarissa hired an attorney, Angela, who filed an ex party request the following Tuesday, asking the court to enforce the judgment and requiring that Richard be, uh, be made to turn the kids over to her. The court reviewed the papers, determined that under the code, under section 3064, that Clarissa had not shown that there's an immediate risk of harm or that they will be removed from California. She did ask for an order shortening time for her RFO. The first date available was December 3rd, so nearly six weeks later. David tells Clarissa that uh, she can have Zooms with the children, and he doesn't send the children to school and decides to homeschool them, homeschool them. He says that he does not feel the school is safe. What are Clarissa's remedies? Um, you know, I, I want to say that I want to note, first of all, that uh, Peter developed this, this um, uh, uh, hypothetical. And I, I want to just note, doesn't this hypothetical illustrate so many of the kinds of situations that we've all seen over the past 18 months. Now, Peter, will finish the, the hypothetical. So I'm taking the blame. I just want to make it clear. Clarissa is the ex-wife and Anne is the girlfriend. If I mix that up, I take full responsibility. It's not the first time I've mixed them up. So prior to the hearing on Clarissa's RFO, Ben's school principal sent a letter to the parents stating that Ben could not return to school unless he presented proof that he was vaccinated. And of course, based on the, the recent rules, he can be vaccinated uh, and the availability of the vaccine. Clarissa asked the court to give her authority to make medical decisions 
relating to the children should the court grant her request. So in the program, we're going to go through some of the legal issues raised by uh, this hypothetical, and we're going to give you citations in the material to the very few cases that weigh in on choice of schools, choice of medical decisions, and how you can be proactive in creating orders and judgments that will anticipate the future. All right. So in being able to do it prospectively, what we anticipate is that although many of the judgments I see award joint legal custody and say nothing more, you probably want to anticipate not only that a pandemic is still in existence, which it is, but we're going to have situations that are while not a pandemic, emergency situations. If you're in Los Angeles, there's going to be an earthquake. You know, there, there are going to be other things coming up. If I'm looking at a legal custody order that has the specifics in it, it lets me know both who makes decisions on what issues and when decisions need to be made, how they're to be made, and what an emergency is. Those are the three things I'm going to be looking at. Should parents plan, uh, should the parenting plan continue on a regular basis if a child is sick? That's not an issue exclusive to a pandemic. That's come up all the time. And the question is how sick? Um, if it's the type of illness that is transmissible, if it's not, um, there, I would consider that there is a benefit to children um, in knowing that each of his or her parents are capable of meeting the child's needs and comforting the child when the child is ill. So unless, it, unless a child cannot be transported, um, I'd be looking for some evidence um, as to what the situation was. And that's something you can anticipate if you have a chronically ill child, but probably something that you can't anticipate if you don't. Um, I'm looking in a situation like this for um, cooperation and the extent to which each parent's decision making, taking into account the changes in the schedule because of COVID and because of the uh, hybrid models of education for over a year. I want to see who's making decisions in a child focused way um, and understand that although there is still you know mandatory mediation or conciliation um, with family court services or if you choose to do it privately a mental health professional this is an unprecedented situation for them too don't expect there to be a mental health professional who's previously gone through a pandemic and knows what this is supposed to look like so something we think about when we're drafting judgments, but even more because of the pandemic, we got to look at all clients, not just high net worth clients, but the um, middle income people and even low income, because uh, we don't really think about advising people to update their estate plan. And many people don't have estate plans. They don't have, they have a will that designates who the guardian will be if both parents die. Um, um, uh, advise clients to get long-term care uh, insurance if they're sort of in their late middle age, uh, disability insurance and life insurance. For younger people, it's relatively inexpensive and it, it you can get a 30-year term relatively cheap if you're in your 20s, 30s, or even 40s. So you know, now death has become more likely than it was before. And you should anticipate that in drafting your judgments and orders. Um, and make sure there's adequate care for the children if both parents are to die. Um, and it may not be a parent. It, it may be several different people. One isn't alive. I know this is gruesome, but that's sort of the reality that we've moved into. And even though we sort of are putting the past behind us and not thinking about it, we have to learn our lessons. And we'll talk more about learning our lessons from this pandemic 
as we move through this program. So what can we do? What is authorized for them to do? There's some conflict whether the judge has the authority to make orders as to which school the child will go to, whether they should be vaccinated or not, is the only authority that the court has is to award legal decision-making authority. Actually, I've never heard this debate before until I started preparing for this program. And on the listserv, there was a debate about it based on an unpublished case that um, uh, let dad was seeking to change the allow the kid to go to a certain school and mom wanted a different school and the court made the decision um can't cite the case but it came up um so what i would do is plead in the alternative you're going to ask for the court to you know ask that the child be vaccinated or award legal decision making power to the to the parents so they have their um, legal custody authority has for making uh, medical decisions or that medical decision. Uh, I'd be interested in Judge Gould Saltman's input on this. Do you have any? I don't want to put you on the spot, but not know. not not surprisingly, I'm a person with lots of opinions and happy to share them when asked. So I will say that this is a matter of judicial philosophy. And one thing that's important to note is that the Los Angeles Superior Court Family Law Bench has something around a 25% turnover annually. So every four years, with the exception of a few of us stalwarts who are unlikely to ever leave, um, you've got new bench officers in family law, most of whom have not had a family law background. And I think there are two ways of looking at one's job as a family court bench officer. One is, unless you can show me authority that I can do something, I can't. The other is, unless you can show me that I am prohibited from doing something, then I can, so long as I'm addressing it for purposes of something I can do, such as addressing the best interests of the child. Those are two very different ways of approaching the job. And I think that the, um, the tug of war for bench officers on issues like this is on the one hand, the concept of respecting parents' uh, autonomy to do the parenting rather than being a super parent over the two or more than two of them. By contrast, if you feel that your job is to address the best interest of the child, notwithstanding the parents' opinions about that, then you might take the, the position that your job is to protect children even if their parents won't. Understanding that what you're doing when you do that is replacing their belief of the child's best interest with your own. If I can just weigh in briefly as a, as a person that does custody evaluations, I see it as being my job as a neutral to um, assess the quality of parental decision making around any of these complex or controversial issues rather than make recommendations about how the issue should be resolved directly. So if in my view, for example, with respect to vaccination or going back to live school, there's a clear difference between the quality of parental decision making. Um, I'll, I will point out which parent I think has the better decision making and why, as opposed to what the decision about, say, sending a kid back to school should be. And part of the reason for that, by the way, is that I know that I have my own beliefs and values um, about that. Um, I believe that in my own beliefs and values, but they're valid for me. They may not be valued, valid for another. And I don't see it as being my job to put my beliefs over on people, particularly around issues like COVID, where there's so much that we don't know. All right. So looking at legal custody, um, 
Most legal custody orders are joint if they are by agreement. I don't know that that stands um, when they are a contested issue. Um, the decisions that can be made based, based on the child's health, education, and welfare are spelled out in the family code. And if they are not specified, you need to understand that what you have left open for debate in the future, particularly when, it, when it's necessary to make a decision, is that unilateral decision making is okay, but that depends on whether or not it impinges on the other parent's rights. And that whether, whether any given issue does or doesn't invites litigation. So looking at this, one of the issues that was raised in our, our scenario was that one of the parents wanted to do homeschooling. Um, and there have been cases addressing the issue of homeschooling. Um, query whether those cases, while legal precedent, apply in a pandemic. Um, it's all we have. So you have two options here. You either use a case that didn't necessarily address what the situation is in the face of a pandemic versus the everyday situation when all other things are equal, or you analogize the situation when we have a pandemic to something else that disrupted a school system, a war or something like that, you might need to use both if you're trying to be persuasive. In terms of schooling from the judicial perspective, the questions I'm going to be asking and, and other judges may do things differently are whether, number one, whether the parent is capable of either doing the homeschooling or accessing resources to become capable of doing it. Um, I'm going to be looking at the parent who's asking to do it um, what that parent's decision making is based on. Um, so the quality of the decision making, the extent to which it is um, child focused. But I'm also going to be comparing it to other viable alternatives. So in the situation where schools are closed, if there are you know, hybrid models or if the parent is not able to be home all day because of their job and they need to feed the family, um, it may be that there are not options other than the other parent who is able to be home, um, homeschooling the child or schooling the child in some hybrid model. What were, what were the options there? They may be different now. And when you're writing a new um, order or judgment, you need to anticipate things like the emergencies that have happened. In terms of medical decision making, again, I'm always going to be looking at what is the basis for the parent's um, request for medical decision making and how child focused is it. If I've got an evaluation that that may assist me in knowing that otherwise it'll be the obligation of the attorneys to put that evidence before me. So in the Cassidy case, mom's occupation was a parapsychologist. I don't think that helped her case. And, you know, sometimes they call it putting lipstick on a pig. You have to look at your client and wonder, can you present your case in a manner that looks sensible to the court. And, you know, there are decisions that are sensible and homeschooling because you don't want your child to get COVID makes sense. On the other hand, if your client has a history of being on the fringe, you may have, you know, problems. And one person's fringe is another person's mainstream. So we're going to get into that. In this case, um, I believe this is a juvenile court case in, in Ray Eric uh, B. And the father believed, was a, a Christian scientist and believed that spiritual treatment was a um, proper way to treat a child. And there is statutory um protection for these kind of decisions because of the 
you know, separation between church and state. But in this case, the court made a decision to allow the child treatment. And, uh, you know, this is case is good authority when you're in that kind of decision. So the, the court is going to be put in a very difficult decision to respect a religion, but also respect mainstream science and do what's right. Um, I remember when I was a kid that my dad took me to see a case downtown and we watched it and it was Melvin Belli defending a chiropractor who was recommending um, chiropractic treatment over uh, mainstream medical treatment. And the child had died and he was defending the case. It made a great impression on me, but the issue of church and state and uh, treatment, medical problems has been around for a long time and I don't know if it will ever be resolved and that's what makes the practice so interesting. Well, this is also the situation is a little bit different now because we've got the situation, I've not encountered it yet in my court, where people are seeking either religious or medical exemptions from vaccination. Unlike a situation where um, a religious exemption, you know, might affect the one child and certainly understanding that the best interests of the child, both physically and spiritually is part of the charge of the court. In this case, every child who is not vaccinated is a potential carrier. And so it affects everybody, including the judge and the judge's family. So, you know, there, there are additional layers to be considered when making an analogy to things that have happened in the past in light of a pandemic. Particularly. <laughs> It's particularly difficult when you have statistically most children are not going to die from the vaccine. Most adults are not going to die from the vaccine, but there may be, you know, a thousand or five thousand or or ten that die. And it's very emotional to point to those people and say, well, my child could be one of those. I don't want to take the risk even though the risk is 0.0005% when you have 350 million people and probably 75 million children, that's so infinitesimal. But when it comes to your child, who wants to take the risk? Or they don't die, but they're you know, severely disabled. Not easy decisions, but statistically speaking, to me, the vaccine weighs out unless you have some allergic reaction. That's, um, Dr. Simon, do you have a view on this? You know, I think one of the things about the pandemic that's been so interesting for me as a psychologist is the interplay between individual self-determination and the well-being of the broader community. Um, you know, it, it, Early on, when, when, say, for example, California began to emerge from lockdown, some businesses opened up, people started sort of crawling back out into the world. Uh, you know, it, it, I remember thinking that, you know, I, I've got one, a friend in particular who is the extrovert's extrovert. This is an individual who is not content with their, they live alone, they're not content with their own company they can become very, very unhappy when they spend too much time by themselves. And so they started to crawl back out into the social world. And I remember having discussions about with this individual about their needs and their psychological well-being, as opposed to the risk that they were taking by putting films out into the world and potentially placing other people at risk. And so there is that interplay here between decisions that I think are best for me and whether or not those decisions that are best for me are really best for everyone. Bring it back now to me and my role as a custody evaluator. Um, and one of the things that I always think about when looking at parents and looking at, um, uh, you know, child sharing plans and making recommendations about authority and decision making is the degree to which 
a parent is able to see beyond their own needs and see the needs of the child um, or see beyond their own needs and see the needs of the broader family. Here we have, you know, this, this large social discussion now about individual rights versus the, the needs of the greater good. You know, as they, as I remember from Star Trek, the needs of the, of the few uh, take a backseat to the needs of the many. That's also a value. And, um, but, but I think Peter, that you're correct when, 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 it, when a, when an institution such as a court must make a decision about what's going to happen in one of these situations, um, that relying upon statistics, relying upon science, rel relying upon those broader trends, if we have the data to do so, is most likely how that decision is going to get made and should be made. So this is a pre-pandemic case, Jonathan L. Um, and I think, but it's, I think it's still useful. And it got into the issues of homeschooling prior to the pandemic. And I think the arguments are different. Um, but before, parents didn't have a constitutional right to homeschool their, ch their children. I see the typo there. Um, and they did not qualify for the private tutor exemption. So there's a statute on this. And there are exemptions to sending your children to public school. And since 2008, I believe that homeschooling has become much more common, at least in my world, which is interesting because with both parents working um, now, you know, it's, it's not that common, but it does come up. Now parents like in our hypo has an excuse to homeschool his child when he's apparently trying to prevent Clarissa from having time with the children. So it gets to be very tricky and you have these legal overlays, but as schools go back into session and children can be vaccinated, I hope that these issues are going to subside until they come up again. Um, there's also this interesting case called Enrique M versus Angelina that talks about legal decisions regarding uh, based on best interests and in constitutional rights. So I uh, commend those cases because there are some of the few on the subject. And, and one of the factors the court is supposed to take into consideration in determining the best interests of children is the extent to which either parent um, can provide moral guidance to the children. Um, there have certainly been a number of moral issues raised by how people treat each other during emergencies, including during a pandemic. Um, and the extent to which they they can and choose to cooperate or can't or won't cooperate. And those are, are factors that existed before a pandemic was known. Um, now, in terms of who makes the decision and who makes the decision when you can't get into court um, or can't get into court on a timely basis, We've, we've got some history in there. It's pretty clear under Ruiz and Tirio that judges can't order um, special masters absent a stipulation of the parties in California um, for custody issues. There are states in which that is not the case, but that is current law in California. We can't delegate um, custody and visitation issues to anybody else, including a custody evaluator under Bergeron and Boyd. Um, the only way we can do it is if there's a stipulation and if there is any kind of referral, and we'll get into that in a minute, um, if it comes back to us with recommendations by the person to whom it's been referred, it only becomes a piece of the puzzle, as does any bit of evidence, including a custody evaluation, for the court to assess the best interests of the children. It is not by itself the evidence, unless nobody puts on other evidence. 
if I can just make a somewhat off topic comment about this issue of delegation of decision making delegation of authority. Um, when parties stipulate to the use of a parenting plan coordinator, and, and as, as Judge Gould Saltman pointed out, it has to be an agreement, it has to be stipulated to the court can't order it. So when parties stipulate to that, then a parenting plan coordinator may be given discretion to make orders um, as, as given that authority by the court. I often see in, uh, sometimes in LA, less so in LA, but um, I often see parenting plan coordination appointment orders that are very vague, diffuse, non-specific, and that in my opinion, actually step outside of the court being able to narrowly um, uh, give it narrowly give its discretion to a third party with their with the agreement of, of the uh, of the you know the uh, litigants. So I just want to make a, a statement to all of the attorneys that are listening that when you are a part of a case that's going to have a parenting plan coordinator, that you be very clear and very precise and even in checklist form, what are the specific decisions? you know, parenting plan decisions that you delegate to the parenting plan coordinator to make orders on. Uh, when it's not specific, what tends to happen is the parenting plan coordinator does what I call going rogue, and they begin to take on or believe they're taking on authority for areas that they don't really have the, the ability to do so. And things, then you end up litigating the whole issue of the PPC, which subverts the whole point of the PPC, which is to keep the parties out of court and drive them towards agreements. Yes, so, I want to interject. We supplied you with a form, I think, um, designed by the Los Angeles Superior Court in 2008, and it's very detailed, and we'll be going through some of the items in that form. So I, I hate to say you can't go wrong uh, by using that form because you can always go wrong, but it's so detailed that and it gives you so many options and so many levels of decision making that I think it can be helpful to you. I also want to say that this slide, um, the question should be, should a child over the age of five be vaccinated because Children over the five, age of five can be vaccinated. So, Robert, take it away. Um, by the way, those forms from the L.A. County are terrific. I recommend to attorneys in other counties that they use them um, because they are, a, a, they are in checklist form. Um, and for those of you who use them, great. For those of you who are not using them, strongly encourage you to begin using them. In like fashion, by the way, when you write orders appointing custody evaluators in your cases, the more specific the scope of the evaluation is, the better off you are. When I see orders that say things like Dr. Simon shall decide, you know, whether exchanges shall take place at school or take place at the park and any other things he thinks he needs to opine on. That's extremely broad and I, I, I think is probably not the smartest order or maybe even a competent order under Siegendaller, but not being a lawyer or a judge, that's just my lay opinion. Okay, back to the topic at hand. I think we all agree that public policy should inform judicial decisions. So for example, should a child attend school? We know what public policy is about that. Should a child be allowed to travel on public transportation? Should a child over the age of 12 be vaccinated? These are broad issues which have a subjective quality to them, but to the extent that there is public policy around issues that inform what is usually best for kids, judicial decisions are driven by that public policy. With respect to you know, this homeschooling issue, which is a, such an interesting COVID conundrum, um, we all know that kids were homeschooled for many, many months um, during the, the, you know, the real dog days, if you will, of, of this pandemic. What was so interesting was the way in which homeschooling then began, that COVID necessitated homeschool, then began serving the needs of parents 
who tend to be helicopter parents, who tend to to uh, hover over their children. Um, it served the needs of parents where there was co-parents where there was disagreements about whether children pre-COVID should be homeschooled or public schooled, private schooled, whatever, homeschooled or schooled outside the home. And it certainly began to serve the need of some restrictive gatekeeping that was taking place. And so it's critically important to tease out the portion of the decision making around the educational needs of the child, which involved, by the way, their social needs and interpersonal needs and the parts of the parental decision making, which may serve another agenda for one or both of the parents. And then, of course, we have the, the typical, you know, average child. Um, and none of us who are parents think our children are average. But nevertheless, the typical child versus a child who has a higher risk of illness uh, for some, some and there are many medical reasons that can be the case, or a child with special needs. And by the way, when I think about special needs, we typically think about kids with learning disabilities or developmental issues, pervasive developmental disorders. But we also need to think about children who are extremely bright. Um, whose learning needs may be different than a typical student. We also need to think about whether a particular school's didactic uh, approach is suitable to the need of a particular child. So all of these details need to be considered when uh, approaching making recommendations or decisions about any particular child. The broad generalities um, are important, but it's always a case-specific decision about these children who are at issue in a particular matter. Again, other, uh, other things. Are play dates okay? If children are, are being homeschooled because of COVID, because of their vaccination status, because of concerns on the part of a parent that putting a child in a classroom where they're forced to wear a mask, or putting a child in a classroom where they have a plexiglass cubicle around them and they're walled off from other children, or just putting kids in a classroom where they're exposed to other children and that parent doesn't know what those families' protocols are for COVID, are play dates okay? And if so, how? Um, what about the use of nannies, Uber drivers, public transportation, other people to assist in, in custody exchanges, to what degree do we look at what those people's COVID protocols are in their life and what risk they may bring to the child? Do we have a right to know their vaccination status? I mean, when you get in an Uber, do you ask the driver if they're vac vaccinated? And does, does that driver have any legal obligation to inform you of that? So, so again, these are some of the remedies for some of the some of the solutions to these problems about, for example, socializing children or getting children to school also have uh, uh, downside risks that we have to have to look at very carefully. It's interesting that during the pandemic, there was so much pressure on parents here. They're trying to work from home, homeschool their kids. Um, they were isolated. The pressures were immense on people. And as the judge pointed out, you know, there's repercussions from that, but they don't get to court till a year later, six months later, and then everything has changed. It, it is interesting because of the time lag that, you know, the issues are still there, but they're looking back retroactively to what happened back then and very, very tough. So, you know, what are the remedies from a judicial officer's point of view? Um, what if a parent doesn't comply with parenting plan using COVID concerns as an excuse? All right, so I, I think it's probably important to note that at least I try as a judge um, not to measure the quality of people's parenting by the worst thing they had ever done or the best thing they've ever done. Um, so when somebody under extraordinary circumstances has done something that under normal circumstances would not be acceptable to me, I guess I have to go underneath 
the facts and see why. Um, so if somebody hasn't complied with the parenting plan, I'd want to see when that occurred because understand I'm, I may get stuff a year later and so we're, we're now looking you know, retrospectively, what was that situation when that situation happened? Uh, you know, was it April of 2020 or did it happen last week? That makes a difference to me. And what were that parent's alternatives to the thing that they did that was non-compliant? Did they, you know, not return the child Sunday because, you know, there was some you know, thing in the news that made it very dangerous, but Monday they did return the child, or did they not return the child for several months? That would, you know, what kind of non-compliance are we talking about? And I'd probably want to see if there was any kind of a pattern of similar behavior before COVID, such that COVID became the excuse um, to continue on a pattern of non-compliant behavior, or if this was anomalous and a parent who had otherwise, you know, been been pretty cooperative with the co-parent, you know, panicked when um, the worst of COVID came down and everybody didn't know how bad it was going to get. Um, in terms of child care, what are the remedies if there is none available or none affordable to these parties um, or the parents disagree about the child care? Again, this is one of the situations where, at least my philosophy is that I do not pick, I pick the picker. So I would want to know what the basis for the parents' decisions about child care are, if there really wasn't um, available, or if they didn't like what was available, and what were the options from which they selected, and the criteria by which they came to the process of the decision that they made. Um, so I can't know what the remedies are until I know what the problem was. Was it just, was it that they disagreed on two perfectly fine child care providers or that there wasn't anything that they could afford anywhere near where they were? Um, in terms of job loss, furloughs, and other economic consequences of COVID, of course we have to take those into consideration. Of course, if modification is appropriate, then that's what we do. We set reviews. Um, my understanding is that presently there are more openings, job openings available and there are applicants to fill them, but that does not mean that it is a job available in the community of any particular set of parents or jobs for which any particular parent qualifies or for pay that could sustain any particular family. So again, unlike a custody evaluator who's part of whose job is to develop facts, I get what you give me. You come in, you present your evidence, and that's my closed universe other than things of which I may take judicial or general um, notice. Um, Judge Consultant, I so I so appreciate your talking about not allowing a uh, a particular event to come to typify or characterize a parent broadly. I think that's such an important point that we have here, and I'm thinking about a case um, that I was involved in where the, the father in this case traveled quite a bit for his work, and just before you know COVID closed everything down, he'd both been in Asia and he'd been in Italy. And so you can imagine that it, there was great deal of concern on the part of his co-parent, the children's mother, that perhaps he'd been in places where COVID uh, was more prominent than it had been in the States and that he was carrying the virus in him. And in those days, we had no way of knowing exactly what those risks were, how it was transmitted. And this mother um, did not allow the father to, to see the children through about the middle of May, uh, pardon me, the middle of April of 2020, so about a month. Um, and um, to this day, the father's attorney is still trying to explain how this was an extraordinary, pardon me, the, the mother's attorney is still having to explain how this was an extraordinary event that we were all of us uh, operating out of fear, and in some cases panic, that we didn't know what was going on. Um, and that the judgment she made at that point shouldn't be held against her now. Um, 
And of course, it can be, and some people would like for it to be. So I think your comment is extremely on point there, especially around um, things where we now look back 18 months later as both professionals in family law, but also just as human beings and realize that we just didn't know back then. And some of the things that all of us may have done or not done that we look back on and think that wasn't so necessary, but it did seem that way at the time. And that's one of the challenges for bench officers now is if I get an RFO that's been pending for a year and a half, right. I now know what I know now. What did they know then when this RFO was filed? And was it reasonable given that state of knowledge? Right, exactly. So remedies for other situations that come up, trying to work at home without child care. Um, I, I don't know that that's a judicial issue. Um, certainly, it, it's of interest to me to see during a period of time where that was the only option available to a family, and by family I mean whether they were living together or they were living apart, how they dealt with the situation. Were they more flexible or less flexible with the existing parenting plan when this emergency situation came up and everybody was on lockdown? I don't know about their children, but I'd like to know whether their children were self-starters. There are children you can hand them a book and put them on a desk and work away and they'll be quiet for the next several hours. And there are other children who are bouncing off the wall and there's no way you could possibly work when that child is not sleeping or out of the house. So I would need to know that. Um, in terms of supervising children, one of the things that I'm looking at now is the extent, again, to which the child required supervision, quite different for a five-year-old than a 17-year-old in some ways. Um, and it may require or may have required altering some custody time based on what each parent's availability was to do that and each child's need for a parent to do that. In terms of mental disorders brought on by isolation and fear and loss of contact with friends and family, those aren't things that we can really address as bench officers, I don't think. Um, it's my belief that we can encourage but can't compel individual therapy. There may be other bench officers who take a different tack on that, but um, I, I like to let families have some autonomy in terms of how they wish to run their family. Um, and I think compelling people to individual therapy is a, a dangerous slippery slope to take. Um, I certainly can't choose their therapist and I suspect that those who don't want to go to therapy but feel either coerced or compelled to do so are likely to select therapists who think like they do, not as I wish them to do, because they're not coming to therapy as what I think most therapists would expect, that you know your life isn't going well, so you've sought a therapist to try to work on the situation so that your life can work better than it does. If compelled, if it's not something um, that they want to do, and it's not because of you know criminal charges and they're made to do, um, I would have great concern about overstepping my authority as a judge. Well, don't jump the gun because you have two slides at the end that talk about your authority to do it. So. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the consequences of violating a custody order to keep their children safe? I mean, we have limited ability. I mean, we can go in ex party as we'll talk about more later, but I think these days most judges are not going to recognize unless a child is in immediate danger of either being abducted or being injured. So, and you're not gonna get an RFO even on a short order shortening time for a month, uh, maybe more. And when you get there, there may be 20 other people who are there and your hearing may be scheduled for another time. So do bad actors get away with the proverbial murder 
by take, using self-help to keep a child? They can. There is a vague threat that a judge might change custody based on that order, but it's probably unlikely. And if you ask for makeup time, I don't know that you're going to get makeup time because that sounds more like a punishment than in the best interests of the child. And why should a child, because they didn't see one parent, get more time with the other when it's six months later and all that has has happened before? So some very tricky issues and often our hands are tied and we have no choice but to try the X party after X party because that's the only remedy when a child isn't seeing their parent. Any comments on this judge or do you want me to move on here? Yeah, I think the, the concept of makeup time is sort of like the concept of punishment. You know, if, if you've done something bad and you're gonna hear about that six months from now when I decide what your punishment is, not very effective. Um, and even if it's not for punishment, it isn't makeup if it's not fairly immediate. It's a reward and this is not a reward or punishment situation. I, I, I like it that you always answer the questions and you don't uh, defer. <laughs> Dr. Simon, do you have a comment I, I, on this? I, 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 I think that, I, once again, I think that Judge Gould Saltman is spot on. And I want to add that the battle then over makeup time is really not about the kids. It's really about the dynamic between the parents and a, about some kind of you know power and control issue between mom and dad especially when we are farther out from the time that the that the one parent didn't uh, have parenting time with the children that they were supposed to have and and so uh, awarding that quote makeup time um, can be seen as a punishment or a reward and awarding it can also unintentionally and unwittingly fuel the power dynamic or the control the struggle dynamic between the parties and I think that all of us that do this work um, are, are looking for ways to help families have less versus more conflict, right? So uh, I think it's important to think about those things in that light as well. So, I mean, the upshot of this is that self-help becomes the order of the day because the parties can't get relief from a court. I think that, you know, as we move along, we're going to have to create orders and judgments that allow or reference judges, and maybe we're getting away from that after the Angelina Jolie case, but people have to look at alternative forms of dispute resolution, resolution and build them into their orders because it, you're sure not going to get that re immediate relief from the superior court. And the idea of people just pulling the children back and forth because they can doesn't sound very appealing to me. So the lawyers are going to have to write that into their orders, the remedies they can. So, so what are the remedies? It's not clear what the um, authority for having a parenting plan coordinator is. Is it under um, Code of Civil Procedure 638, where a referee can be appointed upon agreement of the parties? Uh, and that's fine. You know, the bad actors may not agree to that. They may just want to get away with that. 639 um, implies that a court can order referees, but, you know, the judge cited Rusty versus Theroux for the um, proposition that the court has no authority. I don't know if that's the last word on that. And I couldn't find the last word in researching it. But right now, that seems to be the prevailing thinking. Clearly, uh, a referee can't make a decision, but why can't they make a recommendation just like a custody evaluator could? And clearly, judges can appoint experts uh, to give opinions and against the party's will. And they could um, have solution-focused evaluations and what's the difference between that and a referee so um i would say 
go for it, but give the legal authority for it. And if it's under 730, fine. Um, uh, or that's the way it should be done because the judges will need help. But again, that's not going to happen for months down the road. We didn't talk about it, but there's also authority for having the child testify or having the child testify to a third party, um, appoint uh, a court personnel and interview the child. There are other remedies for this. We didn't cover the children's testimony, but that's always an option and a program in itself. But there are all sorts of tools, but none of them are instant uh, justice by any means. So you could talk more about this as the in this slide, Judge. Well, sure. Um, so a special master or I'm going to use the term parenting plan coordinator because I think that's really what we're talking about here is frequently a mental health professional, but not always a mental health professional. It may be an attorney. It may be a retired judge. Um, theoretically, uh, parties could stipulate to their rabbi or, or their priest if that's what they wanted to do. They've selected somebody that, in whom they've reposed confidence to assist them in making parenting decisions. Um, it is permitted um, by local rule in some county, including ours. We do have the authority. I, I would do it under 638, um, but I do it just by virtue of the fact that there is a stipulation of the parties to do it, assuming that um, it's somebody that they, they have selected mutually and it's not my impression that either of them was coerced to select a particular person. So we've had a couple of questions that address the problem that we've been discussing about people who have been waiting for an RFO for four months and the other parent withheld the child and um, they don't seem to have any remedies. Um, and we answered the question sort of would the court limit the custody of the parent withheld because they're not likely to promote frequent and continuing contact. And, you know, somebody else asked, what are the alternatives to make up time to reunify a child withheld by another parent during COVID? And these are very tough questions that the audience is wrestling with and they're frustrated and I get it. And it's easy to say this was an anomaly but the fact that a parent would withhold a child from the other parent for a considerable period of time and use excuses seems like a ground for changing custody because, you know, that's one of the policies of the state of California is the parents are to promote frequent and continuing contact. And it shouldn't be viewed as a, a punishment, but as my parents used to say, a consequence. And uh, so I think just because we're saying, you know, the parent can get away with it doesn't mean they should and doesn't mean that your judicial officer won't hear the evidence and consider a shift in custody or giving primary custody or decision making custody to the other parent. But I wouldn't count on it because the judges are reluctant to um to take that drastic a remedy. Well, but also let's consider this. When we're referring to somebody as having withheld the children, are we presuming there's an existing court order? And if there is, judges are not the ones who enforce court orders. Law enforcement is there to enforce court orders. So coming to me with a complaint that, you know, they're, they're withholding the child to make them stop, you're holding a judge's order. Go enforce that order. If what you're saying is, there's a pattern of conduct here, I have to, every single time, I have to bring the police just to exercise my parenting time, we need a different parenting plan, and it needs to be something more draconian, that's a different order. That's a different 
thing. So understand what you're asking for when you're coming to me. Saying, tell this other person I really meant it when I made my order the first time, not so useful. And maybe that gives you an idea to craft your RFO in such a way that you're not asking for punishment, but you're asking for a turnover order. And there are provisions in the family code for wording that very specifically. Um, and you might get that relief ex party. I wouldn't count on it. And we'll talk more about the limits of ex parties. But, you know, if you have a vague order, which at first people trust each other and they say, we'll share custody equally or we'll have a 225, but they don't specify what that means exactly. That mean, mean you're asking for specific orders that a judge could do. And that may be easier to seek that relief than the punishment that your client desires, even because the court's not likely to grant that. Uh, Dr. Simon? Yeah, there's, a, there, there's a question in the Q&A that I think we've been partly responding to um, uh, that asks for uh, what are the alternatives to make up time to reunify a child withheld by another parent during COVID. Of course, every case is different and we need to drill down and find out the details. But the thing about this question I wanna to respond to is when I hear the term reunify, I'm hearing that there's some kind of a, of a substantial disruption in, the, in, in one parent's relationship with the child and potentially that the child is resisting seeing that parent. For me, that's a trigger to wonder about what else is going on in that case that requires the reunification. And if, uh, you know, what kind of, of support does that parent have for the other parent's relationship with the child or not? Um, and uh, so I just wanted to, 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 to answer that question because reunification implies to me that there has been a disruption in the, in the attachment, in the trust, in the rapport, such that the child is resisting, refusing, or is fearful about seeing that parent. And when I hear the word reunification, I think Family Code Section 3026, which I hope everybody memorizes before they come into my court on any custody issue. So what do you like to see from the, spe the special master? Do you want them to make a recommendation as to who should have custody or what do you look for? Well, if, this, if the special master is, is a custody evaluator, it's really going to be under 730 or it's going to be under 31, 10, 31, 11 or 31, 18, I guess. Um, then I, I frankly need to see the analysis. That's what I'm looking for. Not so much um, the recommendation. I want to see data gathering and I want to see analysis of the data that's been gathered. That will let me know what to do. If it's a parenting plan coordinator, depending on the level of authority on any particular issue, if what comes to me is essentially the appeal of a decision slash recommendation by the parenting plan coordinator, it's going to be at a higher level generally um, of most things. It's going to be either a substantial change of custody time as between the parents or something more drastic than that. Judge Gould Slotman, I've got a question for you. Sure. You said you don't enforce orders, you make orders, that law enforcement enforces orders. Correct. And yet how many times have we all been critical of and seen parents be properly criticized for calling the police to enforce the order and getting the children involved in that. I'll weigh in on that. Um, judges don't seem to like it when a parent calls the police. And I've had myself and the client virtually yelled at by the judge for the client calling the police where the child was there and it you know, saying that it made a bad impression on the child and created, uh, hurt the child and was not in the best interest. So you're darned if you do and you're darned if you don't. But, but, the, but the bottom line is we are absolutely not the enforcers of custody orders. We, we may be the enforcers of financial orders. We can issue contempts. We can, you know, order 
you know, interest, we can do all kinds of things on financial issues, but on custody issues, we can't generally enforce. Um, we can make new and different orders if those are necessary, but asking us to make the same order that exists is not particularly productive. So these, uh, these slides are yours, Robert, but let's move through them since we only have sure. 10 minutes and uh, 12 minutes. So, um. Well, what I want to say with respect to these slides by way of going through them more rapidly is that a parenting plan coordinator is there to help implement the parenting plan that has either been agreed to by the parties or ordered by the court. We're not there to create, craft a custody plan. We are there to assist in implementing the plan. And in my view, our highest calling is never to have to make decisions about implementing the plan, but instead to work with the parties and empower them to their own decisions. So part of the beauty of parenting plan coordinator is that, yes, at the end of the day, we can resolve issues like pickup, transportation issues, um, you know, should the child leave school midday to go to the orthodontist or not, we can resolve those issues without the parties having to go to court. But, it, but I think our highest calling and best use is really as a parent educator and as a um, agent of alternative dispute resolution. Also, one other thing about parenting coordination that the the second um, bullet point on this slide indicates and in issues is that we're not there to monitor the family on an ongoing basis. A parenting plan coordinator, I don't believe, should be scheduling episodic or regular appointments with the family or calling them to check in. We get appointed and much like a judge or a court, we sit quiet and wait until somebody knocks on our door and says, I need your help. We give them our help, and then we close the door and go away. And then if they need us again, they, they call and say, we need your help. It's much like a court doesn't monitor a family. When the RFO is done, the court goes away until a new motion is filed. So some parenting plan coordinators see it as their job to, on an ongoing basis, monitor a family. Not only is that not our job, I actually think that that cripples and incapacitates a family's perception and reality of their own ability to develop the skills to function autonomously. And ultimately, at the end of the day, what we want are autonomously self-regulating, independently functioning, reconfigured family units. So special masters can use a problem-solving me method that they come up with. They can call witnesses if necessary um, to get more input. Uh, they try to work out compromises and they can make a decision that's binding um, unless either party challenges it in court, which from time to time they do. Um, so um, and so this is really- Can I just ask, do they testify in court? Um, and does Sanchez apply? Is it, or is that, should that be waived in the, I don't think this court stipulation, I mean, that was developed before Sanchez was an issue. It was, and I, I've not seen anybody try to bring in um, somebody who is serving as a parenting plan coordinator to then testify. Generally, 99% of the things that parenting plan coordinators have, have done that I've participated in or have, have had some oversight on are the types of things where, you know, it's Friday, it's four o'clock, and there's a reasonable dispute based on the wording of, of the, the order, whose weekend it is. Um, they can figure that stuff out because by the time a Monday ex party could come around, the weekend's gone. So. That's an appropriate use. And exactly as um, Dr. Simon indicated, the best parenting plan coordinator plants seeds along the way as they make decisions to inform the parents how to resolve similar issues as they come up themselves and essentially wean them off the parenting plan coordinator. Um, a stipulation to a parenting plan coordinator requires 
buy-in by both parties of the impartiality and the wisdom of the individual who will be serving as a parenting plan coordinator. You get your judge fairly randomly if you're going through the court system. In this case, you're selecting somebody in, in whom you repose trust, and that's one of, probably the, the key criteria. They're not so easy to find, but you know, counsel together can interview a special master so they can agree. And you should be asking about their experience and preferred procedures and make sure you have everybody's buy-in because without buy-in, it's not going to work. Um, yes. I mean, it's absolutely the case without buy-in, it's not going to work. Um, and I agree with Judge Gould Saltman at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is, is, is work ourselves out of a job. Um, and and let these families go about their business um, to do it. And I I, I want to add that that there is specialty training re really required to be a parenting coordinator. And while many of the usual suspects in the mental health field that do the the court connected therapy or the custody evaluations and mediations do do parenting plan coordinating, it is a specialized skill set. Um, and not each, not everybody has the temperament for it, um, and not everybody has the develop that specialized skill set. So, I'm a I'm a when I'm approached to be a parenting plan coordinator, I am very very open to spending time on the phone with counsel, answering questions, um, working through the potential um, details of my appointment to make sure that everybody's at ease, because then the the attorneys can successfully sell my services to their clients and we have a reasonable chance of succeeding. And the why of this is that we all know custody um, litigation is very expensive and the result is, is unclear at best. It's, you know, a gamble and it is better to get buy-in and it's a, it's immediate. You can get them, Quick decisions, That's right. on difficult issues. So well, and custody and custody litigation always has unintended negative consequences. Um, yes, litigation is 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 necessary in a number of cases, and we have to do that. But um, as they say, you can't make omelets without breaking eggs. And so, by when we litigate custody, invariably there is the unintended consequence of some type of harm or damage being done to the family, to the children, that then has to be mitigated or, or remediated, or maybe it never is. So the more we can avoid it, the better off we are. So maybe instead of calling it alternative dispute resolution, we call it appropriate dispute resolution. Another uh, acronym you're suggesting? <laughs> I are you are you are you putting a sir are you putting a service mark next to that one, Judge? I, I, no, I, I'm going to credit Fern uh, <laughs> Topas Salka for coining that phrase. Okay. So there's a link in the um, PowerPoint. We've also attached the materials to the program, so you can use that too. It's you can find it online. So as we've said, they, the the um, the PPC can provide coaching. They can help the parents make decisions uh, and they can ask that the court adopt it as a court order. Um, and we've got detailed PPC guidelines and in the interest of time, do you want to say anything more about the PPCs, Judge? I, I think we've said all we can say. There is due process. It's just a different process than going to court. So we can look at the slides, but I'm going to skip to the one on um, counseling because we detailed what a parenting plan coordinator can do and how to get one. So... So this is the counseling. You've given us some opinions on your feeling about ordering counseling, but clearly you're authorized to do it when there's a substantial danger to the best interest of the child. Well, it's what that it is that I'm authorized to do that makes all the difference. Since 3190 allows me to order um, a certain type of therapy, which 3191 spells out, it, what it does not do and what 3026 tells me I can't do 
is order anything that is referred to as reunification services as part of a custody or visitation proceeding. Absolutely prohibited. It is not a semantic difference, you know, without a, without a real difference. There is a 1997 case that said, and we really mean it, only Welfare and Institutions Code can order uh, reunification, and so it is only to be done in dependency court. What I can do under 3190 is order counseling, which is not insight-oriented therapy, but behavior-oriented therapy, where I find that the communication between the parties has resulted in damage to the best interest of the child, or to reduce the conflict regarding custody, or to improve parenting skills. That's all I can do. And I need to make certain findings when I do that. So why not seek ex parte relief? I'm sure that um, judges would agree that this is overused because often there's not an immediate harm to the child. They're in custody cases there to help prevent an immediate danger or irreparable harm to a party or to the children involved in the matter. And we're not talking here about domestic violence restraining orders. We're talking about um, non clets ex parte orders. Set forth the rules here, go directly to the court rules, and it gives you a specifically um, what the declaration must state in the California Rules of Court 5.151. And I don't need to read them here, but you better have facts. You better write them. Rules are detailed. You must use the resource center. You may or may not get a hearing. Our experience is we're not getting hearings. A judge just rules and you get notice of the order. You know, in the good old days, you could argue your case in open in chambers and then it went to open court. Now you're fortunate if you get a hearing at all. So I'm going to skip through these rules. Please read them. And let's conclude with Robert Simon, Dr. Robert Simon, on what did we learn from COVID, hopefully. These are some of the things that, that we were having a discussion, uh, Peter and I were discussing, and uh, some of the things that came to mind for what we've learned through COVID. And there's many more points, of course. First, we're resilient. Here we are. Um, I, I, I think that our, for example, our family law community is thriving, and yet we have been disconnected. So we're resilient. We have found ways to cope and thrive. We are able to stay connected without physical presence. There's a typo there, I should say, without physical presence. So thank goodness for the electronic technology and our quick adaptation to it. That the court system can increase efficiency through technology. Um, I think that's a great lesson. We can all do a whole lot of things that we didn't think we could do remotely. Uh, we've learned to use technology to continue our relationships. We've learned to create a, uh, the importance and values of support systems to get us through tough times and through adversity and to lean on those support systems. We've been reminded that we can't change others. We can only work on ourselves. And here I'm talking about things like um, whether we choose to get vaccinated, whether we choose to be mask wearers when we go to the grocery store, whether we, um, you know, choose any other a number of other public health behaviors. We choose what we do. We can't make others do it. And that communities coming together can move mountains. I think it's remarkable. And it, no matter how fractured we may be as a nation, it is remarkable what we have accomplished in 18 months with regard to this pandemic by coming together, by pooling resources and desires. And so, whereas I don't think any of us uh, are glad COVID happened, or certainly if you are, uh, I've got an appointment for you just after this is over. I'll go back into clinical work. I don't think anybody's happy. We've got to look at the silver lining. We've got to look at the positive lessons learned. We've got to learn to see what we can take from this really difficult experience that enriches our lives and um, uh, it expands our sense of well-being and creates gratitude. Thank you. 
All right. Thank you very much, panel three, Judge Gul Saltman, Dr. Simon, Peter Walzer, for a wonderful panel discussion. It was informative, insightful, and certainly enlightening. We really appreciate your time and effort and dedication to educate our legal community. Thank you we for having also, us. Thank you. And we would also like to thank all of our attendees. We started out this morning with about 120 attendees, and we still have about 100 people still hanging around past 3 p.m. This is amazing. Again, please keep an eye out for emails from BHBA for upcoming family law events, including the nonprofit and volunteer services webinar in December, Three Amigos webinar on January 26th, Judges Night in February, which will be in person, very exciting. And don't forget about um, our own monthly lunch hour podcast, Direct Examination with Dan and Lauren. December podcast happening on the 1st of December with Judge Elizabeth Scully. Thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your weekend.